Hi there. I'm Bert Goldman, creator of Quantum Jumping, and you are welcome to my home. Come on in. I'll give you a little tour. This is my home. This is where Marianne and I live, along with Baby. Baby's a little tired right now, aren't you, Baby? We'll bring him back to life. Now, we chose this home. I've been out in the desert for quite a while. We chose this home because I love Hawaii. And this home really reminds me of Hawaii. Let me show you a bit of the outside. As Hawaii is one of our most favorite places, we want to bring a bit of Hawaii to the desert. And I believe if you look around, you'll say that we did succeed somewhat. Let's go into my office. This is where the magic happens. Now, when I said this is where the magic happens, I meant that literally because as soon as I sit down in this chair, this is my magic chair. This is my automatic jump chair. I hear about people who can't find anything to do and when they're 60 and 70 years old, they're looking forward to retirement. <laughs> Well, obviously, I don't look forward to retirement. Retirement for me is like hitting myself in the head with a hammer. That's the last thing in the world that I want to do. I want to be creative every day. Every day, I wake up with this one thought in mind. How can I be more creative today? How can I help other people? Now, aside from everything else, I'm involved in business every day. As a matter of fact, I'm involved with business every minute of every day. But my business is really your business because my business is helping other people and has been for many, many, many years. My business is all on the computer. And of course, there's Facebook. It always surprises me when I look and see that I've got 77,000 fans on Facebook. And I talk to them every day. For me, Facebook is just another way to reach people, to, to give them a helping hand. And not only do I have this Facebook, but there's two blogs that I'm very, very proud of, I might say. The Dear Bert blog started by my having a newsletter at one time. And one of the things that I, I kind of got from the Dear Abby column, I had a Dear Bert column where I give advice to people on just about every aspect of their life. Well, when we got into the internet, I thought, maybe I'll do a video log, a blog, so to speak. And thus, Dear Bert came along, and I just finished my 137th video recording. And you can see all of them on YouTube. Just search Bert Goldman. 137 weeks in a row. And of late, I've started Quantum Jumping. We have a blog there with over 50. I'm into my second year of doing that. So I do two video blogs every week. I managed to find time for all this. Uh, here's a question I just got on the blog. How can I limit the feelings projected at me from people who are harassing me? I need a technique to stay positive while blocking negativity directed at me. What do you suggest? And that's from Marilyn Williams. Well, that's a good question. We had a scientist at UCLA who called people who are taking energy from you, energy vampires. And he told the story of a man who was a writer. And every now and again, his wife would come up and visit him and bring him a cup of coffee or a glass of tea or a sandwich. And every time his wife came up to see him, he felt depleted. And finally, he told her, stay away from him. And don't you love me anymore? She said, yeah, I love you, but when I'm writing, I don't want you there. Well, as it turned out, she was an energy slurmer. 
Every now and again, she was depleted of energy and she needed a slurp. She was an energy vampire. And she knew that whenever she visited her husband, she felt better. She'd walk up, give him a cup of coffee and <laughs> slurp some energy from him and walk by and she felt wonderful, but he felt depleted. Now there are people like that. They're energy vampires. I remember once I was in a coffee shop and a mailman comes in, typical energy slurper. He sits down next to me, he looks at me, he says, boy, what a lousy day. Well, I thought it was a beautiful day, but not for a mailman, apparently. He had a walk, he was a walker. And then he started telling me all the things that were wrong with the world, and all of this, and all of that, and I realized I'm sitting next to an energy vampire. He felt good after about a half hour, he got it all out, and I was beginning to feel weakened by it. And so I use one of the techniques that I use, which is an energy shield. What is an energy shield? Whenever you're in the vicinity of somebody that you consider to be an energy slurper or an energy vampire, somebody who, when you leave them, you feel worse than you did, just imagine a psychic shield between you and them, a sheet of glass, if you will. If you want to be nasty, put a mirror on the other side. Does that work? It works so well that I must tell you this little story. I was doing a seminar in North Hollywood and I was explaining the energy shield business and how it's a real thing. And people accept it. You know, I, I don't lie and people know that. And so they felt that I believed it certainly, but it wasn't necessarily true. And so I says, I'm going to show you how real these things are. Now the room we were in was about 20 feet wide and maybe 50 feet long. And there were about 150 people there. And I took one person and I pulled her to the side and I whispered in her ear, I want you to put an energy shield somewhere in the room from that wall to that wall. Don't tell anyone where it is and don't tell me where it is, okay? And she said, yes. I said, all right, let me know when you've done it. And she closes her eyes and she's looking and she says, okay, I've got it. And now what did you do? She says, I put a wall up somewhere in the room. And I said, all right, now let's see if I can find it. And so I took a, I made myself a little dowsing rod out of a hanger. I took a hanger, made a little L out of it, and I held it in my hand and I slowly walked from one end of the room to the other, telling people I was looking for the shield that she had put up. And when I got to about three quarters of the room, all of a sudden, the little rod in my hand flew over to the side. And I said, it's right here. And she couldn't believe it. She said, that's exactly where I put it up. But that was a good indication of the fact that these mental images, these mental shields that you build are real things. I mean, they are real. Perhaps in the physical world, they would not show up, but somehow in the metaphysical world, they do, and they are real. So when you put a shield up between you and another person, it's a real thing. It's gonna block their energies. And now, my friends, for the fun part of my day. This is the latest thing for me. Now, as you look around and see these paintings, if you're in this room here, you'd almost have to be in awe, especially when you realize that I just started painting recently. The first time I picked up a paintbrush, I was 78 years old. I had no idea I could paint. When I started painting, I was painting just about like everybody else. Uh, as a matter of fact, this you probably recognize as Van Gogh's bedroom. I wanted my own copy. Couldn't afford one of his. I mean, his sells for millions of dollars. I thought I'd make my own. And I started painting like that. And you know something? I was just like every other painter, except I wasn't as good. There's probably 100,000 painters and every one of them are better than me. So I thought, I've got to get my own, my own genre, so to speak. And I picked on the contemporary genre. How? I saw a Pollock, Jackson Pollock painting that I just sold for something like $50 million. And I thought, $50 million? I think I might be able to, to work on something like that with the help of quantum jumping. And so I took a jump into a me that was a Pollock. Now, those of you who are familiar with quantum jumping know what I'm talking about. So there I was painting 
because he had a different style. He didn't use brushes. I says, how in the world can you not use brushes and paint? And so I got into the, into the twin self of me who was like a Pollock, and I got myself a canvas, of course, and paint before that. And lo and behold, I painted my first contemporary painting, which I felt was kind of politicized, <laughs> politicized. I thought that came out pretty good. And so I thought, well, gee, I think I can do that. Uh, let me practice. And then I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Now I've been doing that for about two years. This is my latest here. I'm really proud of this one. I think this is a masterpiece. That's my own personal opinion. I'm sure that Van Gogh thought all of his work was masterpiece. I call this one Dancing Lady. And there is another one called Pterodactyls. Pterodactyl, of course, is a, a prehistoric bird. I thought that was rather interesting. And if you'll just look around and see some of the paintings, here's one of my, another one of my favorites. I call this one Speed. I wanted to give the impression of speed. I don't want to paint a motorcycle. I don't want to take a photograph of a motorcycle. I want to give the impression of a motorcycle. And here's one I did for a friend who wanted a crucifixion scene. My way. Now we're going to go into another part of the room, books. I'm a voracious reader. I don't remember not being able to read. I think I started reading when I was four or five. It, it, it's just something that came to me very easily. And I figured out once that I've read over 3,000 books, but that was quite a, quite a while ago. It's, it's probably up to four, or who knows, maybe 5,000 now. And one day I decided, what the heck, why don't I write my own books? And at the time I was involved with Silva, and so I decided to write a book about Silva. And that was Better and Better. It's a good title, I thought. Then I wrote another Silva book and another, and Silva Mental Dynamics became a, a big hit, and I think it went into 11 or 12 different languages. And then one day I said, why don't I write something for myself, something that I'm gonna really enjoy? And that's when Zyklo came about. Zyklo is a historical novel about a man who is 2,500 years old, but it makes sense history part of it is accurate. I had a lot of fun with that one. And my most recent self-development book, my most recent personal development book, The Power of Self-Mind Control, which is kind of a compilation of everything that I know in the past years that I've been training people in personal development. I wrote a Western, I've written an, an Eastern, a Chinese novel. Uh, it's one of my hobbies. Uh, when I'm not painting and I'm not swimming, the greatest joy in my life is writing. And that's another thing that I got from quantum jumping but didn't even realize it because I had no idea I was a writer. But somewhere within me there was. Somewhere within me was this great writer, this great poet, this great everything just as it is within everybody, just as it is within you, except you have to let them out. How many people who had the voices of a Mario Lanza, a Pavarotti, a Maria Callas, had the same attributes, but they never sang because they didn't know they could, and so they never developed. Motivation, that's what quantum jumping is all about. That's what everything that I do is all about, motivation. Motivation is simply a strong desire. When you strengthen your desire for something, when you strengthen your desire for painting, when you strengthen your desire for writing, when you strengthen your desire for whatever it is that you want, you don't have to worry about motivation. You'll do it. You will do it. You will take that action. And without an action, there's no such thing as success. And when all, by the way I look at it in all my writings and everything that I propose to people, there's no such thing as failure. I love the story of Thomas Edison when he was developing light bulbs. Somebody asked him, how can you keep going? You've had a thousand failures. He couldn't find the right filament. Everything kept burning out. And he said, what are you talking about? I haven't had any failures. I know a thousand things that don't work. 
There's no such thing as failure. You do something, it doesn't work, you do it different the next time. If you do it the same way, you're going to get the same result. That's the key to success. And now we're on our way to the piano. Only thing is, I never learned how to play the piano. But through the magic of quantum jumping, somehow the fingers just fall into the right spot and people seem to enjoy what I do. Unfortunately, I don't read music. And when I play something, it's always original. It's so original, I can't even play it back. And so I got a piano that records as I play. So at least I can hear the song again. But here I go, playing a song that is original. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna have to make it up as I go along. I just let my fingers fall where they might. Like I said, I don't know one note from another. Well, I know where C is. And I just let... Almost sounds like I know what I'm doing. That came out of a quantum jump. Well, that's about it. I enjoy my playing, good, bad, or indifferent. I hope you enjoy it a little bit. Usually I like to play the piano to help people. As an example, if somebody's got a headache, I'll play a headache tune to take away headaches. What's a headache tune? I put energy into the piano. That I know how to do. I put energy into the piano to take away a headache. As an example, if anybody's got a headache now, listen to this and your headache will go away. Thank you so much for coming, folks. I hope you enjoyed the tour of my home as much as I enjoyed showing it to you. Thank you so very much. And do remember, it all came out of quantum jumping. Bert Goldman saying goodbye for now. Have a wonderful day, a marvelous week, a fantastic month, and a sensational year. A friend of mine is a whole lot smarter than me. Everybody wanted to know how he got so smart. So another friend comes over to him one day and says, how do you get so smart? He says, I take smartening pills. Guy says, smartening pills, what are those? He says, well, here, see these little pills I got in my pocket. Guy says, where do you get them? He says, you can't. He says, I have the last batch. He says, well, how much are they? He says, $25 each. He says, well, can you sell me one? He says, well, I can sell it to you, but I got to get $50 because it's my last one. Guy says, here's $50. He says, what do I do? He says, eat it. So he takes it, puts his mouth, pooey, pooey, spits it out. He says, tastes like rabbit poop. Guy says, see there, you're getting smarter already. You're supposed to laugh at